You need some more speed records in this day and age. You need coverage. Coverage? Oh, you mean them little root weevils that crawl around popping off cameras in your face? Those root weevils write history. Many of you know that quote by Jack Nicholson and a few good men. You can't handle the truth. Well, you can, and Event Horizons will give you those truths. So when you're mad as hell and not going to take it anymore from that memorable scene in Network, you'll know just what to do. We will draw you in and become your news addiction at Event Horizons. Join us Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to noon Eastern Time at freedomslips.com. At Revolution Radio. Our world team members are Dennis Fetcho, John Ilias, David Dunger, Hila Cass, MD, Melanie Richton, Jim Mars, Paula Harris, John Trallo, Maria Payan, Christopher Husser, DODDS, Jonathan Orchard, and me, your anchor, Dr. Robin Falco. Uh, if you decide not to volunteer, it will not be held against you in any way. Sounds dangerous. It is. Very dangerous. Count me in. That's right here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps. Enjoy your extra big ass fries. You didn't give me no fries. I got an empty box. Would you like another extra big ass fries? I said I didn't get any. Thank you. Your account has been charged. Your balance is zero. Please what? come back when you can afford oh, to make no, a purchase. No. I'm sorry you're having trouble. Come on. Trouble. I'm My sorry kids are you're starving. having trouble. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio. Here at Revolution Radio, we believe in freedom of ideas, freedom of speech, but above all, we believe in freedom of existence through self-reliance. This station is 100% listener-supported, and as a fundraising promotion, I have a kick-ass free gift for a $100 donation. 35,000 seeds. 25 years in the freezer. Long-term storable, 54 different varieties. So if food prices go crazy... The shit hits the fan, or if you just want to save tons of money every year by creating your own food, like I do, grab our Seed Pack Special. Just look for the banner on the homepage at freedomslips.com. Don't be a statistic. Don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. We need, as humans, to start taking care of ourselves and not depending on the megacorps to provide unhealthy, nasty food. Included in this package is also a DVD with 900 survival and off-grid living documents and the offline home canning how to do everything website all on the DVD. So when you're growing all that food, you know how to can it, store it, preserve it, etc. with all these documents. So thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I hope that you will pick up this package and start learning to be free. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps and freedom is one seed that needs to be planted. What we do in life, it goes in eternity. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Joe Kiernan, host of Researchers Radio Live, co-hosted by my man Dave Stanett and Tim Sees here producing as well. How are you tonight, gentlemen? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good day. Good day. I know we have some some Aussie friends listening to the program, and uh, it's it's always so strange. I want to say good morning to them, but it's <laughs> it's approaching afternoon, really. It's so strange. It's uh reminds me the world the world's really not so big sometimes, you know, when you think how could it go around so fast? But so how's the weather up there, Dave? Yeah, it's starting to turn. I was up in the mountains this weekend working on the house and the mountains are green and right on. The rivers are roaring. <laughs> we had some uh some bad storms come here th- the other night, possible tornadoes and uh it was just some some bad wind, but it threw. It was like ninety degrees every single day, and it dropped it down to the seventies. So it's been pretty moderate the last few days. It's yeah, nice we for, haven't gotten nice any like it. It's been yeah. kind of sitting in the mid sixties here. All right, all right, Tim, how are you? Doing well. Doing well. Doing well. Um, 
You sound distant. I mean, it's pretty similar up, similar up here. You sound very far away. Do I? You do. Can you hear me now? Hear me um, now? I hear you. <laughs> Fantastic, buddy. <laughs> sound yeah, great. We uh, we were supposed to get supposed floods to get in this area up here in uh, upstate uh, New York, but. New York. You know, I only it didn't really pan out. Thankfully, I'm not going to say I'm complaining about that. Right on. Yeah, they're, they're calling for frost patches what? up in the mountains. I'm like, really? Wow, <laughs> man. Wow. So uh, last week we had a good show. Linda Zimmerman had great feedback, and uh, I want to thank her again for coming on. And uh, we have some good programs coming up. But today's program we have uh, Mr. Robert W. Sullivan the fourth a 32nd degree Freemason, author of The Royal Arch of Enoch, and also the author of an upcoming book that will be released next week. And that book is known as Cinema's Symbolism. And uh, obviously, just as the title is, it's a lot of symbolism hidden and placed in, in movies and TV and basically scattered around and uh, without people's notice for so long. And uh, it's usually under design, and uh, we're, we're going to get to pry into and in how people go ahead and uh, planning these things. It's been done in arts for a number of years, and motion pictures is one of them. And uh, we know there's been a lot of symbolism placed through them, and uh, it would be nice to see if there is a particular arrangement of all of them, a little bit of symbolism in, in everything, as, uh, yeah, as I'm sure it is. And uh, I, I'm excited about having him on. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I, I am a big fan of any 30-second degree that wants to come on and chit-chat. Definitely. You know, it's, it's funny because it, that's probably one of the nagging questions I have is we, you know what's going on and you know the scale on which it's going on. So who's co coordinating the goings-on? So. I, I understand. It's uh, – it's key people, but, you know, as I think it's been very clear, uh, people uh, understand my take on it is it's it's really not so much what people think, but uh, I can't control what people think or believe. Uh, people, you know, I'm sure there there are Freemasons that are up to no good. Uh, however, they're, they're not all bad. Uh, and in the same respect, there's a lot of Masons that are uh, members to lodges that uh, you, it might as well just be a social club per se that uh it's it, true purpose isn't uh learning of of teachings uh, and ways you know i i would suspect that uh even if there isn't a let's just say diabolical scheme plan uh let's just say that um uh, at one time there probably wasn't and more or less i i would say it's probably just been exploited you know, if they're hey, that's just my take. Right. Um, right. Well, I mean, it's it, as I say, I come from a family of Scots and some of them are, are Masons, but, you know, it doesn't seem to be. It doesn't make them bad. It doesn't make them bad. Right. Either day. Right. Yeah. I have friends that are Freemasons. And you know, I, I like the, the Latin expression. I, I use it a lot because English is such a terrible language for expression. But there's it this is. expression. <laughs> it's post hoc ergo propter hoc. And what it means is. Uh, Basically, it's, it's, it's easier to explain it by a similarity. It's, it means, essentially, if it's every time it rains, uh, my knee hurts. But just because my knee hurts today doesn't mean it's raining in, in the same sense where uh, just because there might be people that are wrongdoers in opinions or in fact, uh, just because they might be a, a Freemason or of any level or any association doesn't mean the rest of them are. Or does it? You know, this this might be something we could ask Mr. Sullivan. Um, I'd be uh, delighted to find out. To be honest with you. Well, it's sure to be an interesting show. We're gonna see if we could bring him in here. I'm gonna give him a call. You know, and um, uh, I'm really grateful he'll join us. I'm particularly happy about his book being released this week coming hello? up. Hello, Mr. Sullivan. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm very good. This is Joe Kiernan. We have Dave Stinnett and Tim C. with us. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so good much evening. for joining us on the program. We are we are live on air. Uh, just okay, giving, great. Just giving you a heads up. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are very much looking forward to this. Uh, we were just discussing your works, uh, the past and, and the, the, the future one coming up here. And, okay, great. And uh, I was kind of hoping 
uh, we could ask you uh, a little bit of the burning questions that uh, I, I know you've answered before. Uh, sure. And and it's it's always I'm sure you know more than anyone. It's it's something that's highly debated, and either way, it's always a good discussion. Uh, right. You you before you were an author, uh, you 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 are a Freemason, and you had reached the level of the thirty second degree Mason. Correct. Okay. Uh, at what point? Did you decide to take up authorship uh, in, in a in a works of publishing? Well, it actually, it actually started pretty much before I became a Mason and be, before I became a thirty uh, second. Um, I started this book. The research actually began when I was a student at Oxford University in nineteen ninety two ninety three. Um, that's where sort of the groundwork um, was was laid for this. Um, you know, I was, I was always interested in, in the mysteries and the hermetic tradition, things like that. Um, you know, it, it wasn't anything I was, you know, like being taught there. This was just more like a side thing. I mean, I was taking courses in history, you know, like the Napoleonic Wars, things like that. Mm -hmm. So it was over there that I was introduced to the works of like Peter French. He's got a book out about John Dee. Of course, the works of Francis Yates and Giordano Bruno. And she's got a book about the Rosicrucians. Um, and it just really fascin fascinated me. And it just, you know, continued this research and I come from a long line of Maryland Masons. And, um, um, again, I, I was still in college at the time and I, I came back to the States and, um, in, in 1995, I graduated Gettysburg college. Um, and, um, this was prior to going to law school, which was in 1997. I, I was presented with an opportunity to join a Masonic lodge, um, here in Baltimore, um, to make a long story real short, you have to, the, the line is to be one, ask one. And a, a friend of my mother and father was one, and I had seen his Masonic ring, and I said, hey, you know, this is something I've always been interested in. Um, and I filled out the petition. He recommended me to the lodge. Um, this was in 1996. Um, I, you know, I, I went through the application process. I was admitted. I went through the three degrees of Blue Lodge Freemasonry in 1997. Um, and I basically became a, a third degree Mason um, right prior to me going to law school in 1997. Um, I joined the Scottish Rite in 1999 and became a 32nd degree. Um, this would have been October of 1999. Um, and I was still continuing to do the research. Of course, I had other things to do. I was in law school at the time. Um, and, you know, I was doing the research. I'd been making notes. I'd been outlining things like that. Um, and it wasn't until the advent of the social media in the mid-2000s with an old page I had called MySpace which I really started, you know, putting pen to paper and posting blogs, photo galleries about a lot of the research I was doing. And th this was met with, um, you know, you know, very positive reaction. Um, I, I got a lot of positive feedback from this. And it, it was around the same time that I was, I was approached by another Masonic friend. Um, th this was someone I, I had known years earlier, and he had seen the page and said, you know, this is all good and fine. But, you know, rather than, you know, kind of, you know, putting posting blogs, why don't you commit yourself to a book? And, you know, as you see in a cartoon, the light bulb went off over my head. Of course, this was something I was already planning anyway. And it really wasn't, you know, around the same time frame that I really began drafting the book, um, outlining it more and writing it. And the, the book was completed um, in the summer of 2011. Um, and it was published in August 2012. And um, there you have it. And it was a great response, great feedback from the book. F fantastic project. Uh, I'm a big fan of the work and, and the topic. Uh, oh, thank you. You had mentioned a few uh, monumental names, in my opinion. You mentioned a few names, uh, people that you were studying, uh, people of uh, the olden days, per se, the Renaissance period. Uh, you mentioned Bruno. I'm a big, big mm -hmm. fan and a uh, big student of Bruno. And you also mentioned uh, the hermetical works. Uh, when, you, when you were doing your studies uh, involving these topics that first drew your interest, uh, in, in even going back to Oxford, uh, did you spend any time uh, researching or studying the works of Marcello Ficino? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, Marcello Ficino, um, Giovanni Pico della Mandarola. Mm -hmm. um, then you get a little on the darker side with um, Cornelius Agrippa. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with uh, those, those guys. So these course, these Bruno, would really set you up with a, a solid foundation for uh, hopping into the, the Freemasonry. Just, well, yeah. Um, what, what you will find is 
Um, and then another name you could throw out there also is Athanathus Kircher. Um, of course. He, he, yeah, he, he, he's uh, influential. What, what you will find is that these Renaissance masters um, that we, you were just naming, we were just talking about, um, you know, that, that their thought um, and a lot of their ideas go into the Enlightenment. Um, and it's really from the Enlightenment that Freemasonry comes out of. Um, at least as a modern day institution, it's born in 1717. Um, now, you know, it does incorporate these older elements of a lot of these missionary mm-hmm. schools coming out of the Mediterranean. Um, but yeah, you, you will clearly see, you know, you know, within Freemasonry, you know, the, the heliocentricity of Bruno Copernicus, um, you will see the hermeticism of Kircher. Um, you will find the, the, uh, you know, proto ritualistic writings of John Tolland, you will find the deism of Schubert, um, of course, John Locke and Rene Descartes. Um, and yeah, you know, mm-hmm. in Freemasonry um, definitely incorporates um, these Enlightenment values coming out of the Renaissance. Um, no doubt about that. You know, and I like mentioning these names. It's uh, because a lot of people forget, you know, when we mention someone like Ficino, uh, you know, it's it's just a name someone could say it's uh, a master a wise a very wise person excellent translator putting these books into latin at the time but what to give the guy credibility and you know, a lot of these people like Ficino is someone who's given us all the plato works we have today and, and things of that oh, nature. these these were these were scholars that uh, you know essentially had wisdom on the mind and and, and not selfishly you know they're No they're, I totally I totally agree with that um, you know, and you get with, uh, you know, the Chino, you have the Corpus Hermeticum, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, ele- the works of Hermes Trismegistus, who, who is a, a premier figure within Freemasonry, um, you know, but both, both, you know, within Blue Lodge and even high degree, probably, probably a little more in the higher degree sense. Um, and, you know, a- absolutely. And then, of course, um, you know, the works of Ficino, um, Corpus Hermeticum, you get into some of the medieval grimoires like Picatrix. This is, of course, influencing Tommaso Campanella, um, these other Neoplatonic, you know, thinkers at the time. Bonfini, and, yeah, the whole crew. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, as the, as the book documents, these guys, um, you know, were definitely influencing Masonic thinkers um, years later. And I think you, you struck a good point a few moments ago uh, that a lot of people don't understand or, or have not been told that uh, the Enlightenment was was really uh, a, a revival of this. The Renaissance really literally meant a, a rebirth of the old ideas and practices, and and it died out quick. And the Enlightenment was was really another coming of age of it, and which uh, some might suggest led to a few revolutions, such as America and French Revolution. Revolution and, oh, I, I, yeah, and absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. Um, you know, you get into these Enlightenment thicker, thinkers um, at the time, you know, and clearly their, you know, their thought is predicated on the Renaissance, you know, the Brunos, the Ficinos, the Pico de la Mandarolas, um, no question about that. And like, you, you're, you're completely correct. You know, you get into this being incorporated into Freemasonry and you, you will clearly see, you know, Masonic fingerprints all over the founding of the United States. And, you know, you will clearly see this as well in, in the French Revolution. Um, you know, definitely these, you know, equality principles taken, you know, maybe in the French Revolution to more of a dangerous extreme. But, um, yeah, I mean, no question about it that this stuff isn't influential. I always consider it highly dangerous anytime you bring the guillotine into the game. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, well, so, yeah. yeah, well, it, yeah, in the, in the Royal Arch, that's actually a Masonic emblem. It's the Pythagorean right triangle. Um, it, well, would you, a, mind uh, it, would you mind if we took it right to there then before I uh, take up too much of your time on uh, the, the early gentleman? Uh, in, in, uh, what, with the Royal Arch uh, of Enoch here, what, what was your inspiration to, to target this idea as a, as a project? Well, what, 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 what got me started, what, what was really fascinating with me was the, with the Royal Arch was, and this is sort of the over, you know, this is, well, not overarching, that's too cliche, but the main theme of the book was, is, um, is what, you, know, you know, when you get into Freemasonry, um, you, know, you know, it has to be, you know, there is this separation between what's called Blue Lodge Freemasonry and the higher degrees. Um, the, the Blue Lodge, and I'll just explain as briefly as I can, um, the, the Blue Lodge is degrees one, two, and three. This is entered apprentice, fellow craft, master mason. Once you complete the master mason degree and do a catechism, you are then a Freemason. 
after that, you have the option, um, and it's completely up to the individual. You can do neither one of them. You can do both of them up joining one of these higher degree bodies, what is called the in, in America, the, the two biggies are the York Rite and the Scottish Rite. Uh, most people have heard of that. Um, the, the Blue Lodge... Uh, 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 the Blue Lodge system is coming out of England in 1717, um, and it's really what it's trying to do on a social level is, is in England at the time you had a lot of these conflicting political socio um, uh, differences that Freemasonry was trying to unify. You had the Stuart, the Stuart, the split, you know, the split within the Stuart family between the Catholics and the Protestants. You still had holdovers. Um, from the Cromwell protectorate, um, you know, and, and Puritanism. Um, and, and what, you know, and of course you had the Settlement Act of um, 1701, which forbid a Roman Catholic from sitting on the throne of England. So Freemason was trying to ameliorate society and try to bring these sort of warring, not warring, but factions together. The higher degrees come uh, a couple years later. Um, these are coming out of France in, 17, in the early 1740s. Um, and it's a controversial subject matter, but I'll make a long story short. Um, it's, it's being, it's the, the higher degrees are being developed by the society of Jesus, um, as a counter reformation vehicle to restore the Stuart Catholic side back to the throne of England. Um, and, and you, you will really see in the higher degrees, um, much more, um, you know, Roman Catholic themes, much more, uh, themes of papal monarchy, but it's this one, it's this one higher degree ritual, which is really one of the premier ones called the Royal Arch of Enoch. And it's so important because, it's within this degree that the lost word of a master mason, this is the word that's lost in the Blue Lodge ritual, is recovered. Um, it's what's known as the tetragrammaton. It's another way of saying the name of God. Um, and the degree is in, in, in what my book is documenting, um, and this is, again, the main thrust of the book, is that this, this higher degree is incorporating elements of the uh, apocryphal book of Enoch, the Ethiopian Enoch, um, which at the time in the early 1740s and the 1750s was lost to Western civilization. Um, it, 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 it goes missing until, um, I want to say, around 1772, 1773. Um, it may be a little later than that. I have to pull the book for the dates. When copies are returned to um, Europe from Ethiopia by a traveler named James Bruce, and even then they just sit untranslated in the basement of the Bodleian Library um, at Oxford University until 1821, but but the thrust of the book is that there must have been a copy out there because this royal arts ceremonial, I mean, it, it even bears Enoch's name, is incorporating elements coming out of the Book of Enoch, which shouldn't have been happening because technically, according to mainstream history, the Book of Enoch um, was lost to the West, you know, until basically 1821. Um, and I get into a lot of the symbols coming out of this degree, the philosophies coming out of this degree, um, and what I put forward in the book is this idea that it's this really this higher degree that's really formulating and shaping the United States of America. Robert, this is Tim. I just wanted to ask you a quick question. Is that okay? Um, oh, absolutely. You, you had mentioned that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but you mentioned that Freemasonry basically um, was started by a, as, a, as a Jesuit um, organization. No. Well, the, the high, when, when you have Within, within Freemasonry, you have the Blue Lodge, and then you have the higher degrees. The Blue Lodge is born in England in 1717. The Jesuits have nothing to do with the formulation of the Blue Lodge. Okay. Years later, when the higher degrees come along, um, the Jesuits create these, these 25 degrees called the Rite of Perfection. Um, and they, and what, what the Jesuits are trying to do is undermine the British monarchy, which they've been trying to do. Um, basically since 1535 or thereabouts when Henry VIII cre created the Church of England. Um, and they've been, you know, the Jesuits are the leaders of the Confirmation. These guys are the, you know, spy masters of Europe, um, using right. subterfuge to undermine, you know, any, any Protestant organization. And of course, Freemasonry is nominally Protestant. Um, it's Christian, you know, Judean Christian, uh -huh. of course. Um, and what, what the Jesuits are trying to do is use these higher degrees um, as sort of a vehicle, it's really the best word I can describe it as, to, um, to, to infiltrate Blue Lodge masonry while at the same time restoring distort Catholic pretenders back to the throne of England um, who, who were displaced in 1688 um, with the Glorious Revolution. Um, that's where the Society of Jesus gets involved with this. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. For, good question, Tim. Uh, Dave, you wanted to get something in here. Yeah, I actually have a, a couple of questions for you, Robert. 
I think mm-hmm. I thought somewhere along my scholarship, I'd come across something that that basically had said that during our uh, war for, uh, for independence from the, the crown, that the European uh, Masons were working with the New World Masons, and they were basically staving off King George and stalling him while we kind of got our act together over here. Did, can you, you know, can you speak to that? Yeah, at all? That, that, that that's somewhat hard to say um, because what, what what you have going on in the United States and England with, with, within the co- within the continental um, with it with it within the continent of Europe, you definitely have Masons supporting the American War of Independence. Um, in fact, some of the people who organize the Scottish Rite in 1801 are descendants of some of the French war leaders who, the main one I'm thinking of is, is Admiral de Grasse. His son um, helps establish the um, Scottish Rite in 1801. Admiral de Grasse is the hero of the Chesapeake who bottled up Cornwallis at Yorktown. Um, but what, what, it's a long, uh, what I'm going to try to do is bottle the answer as best I can, but it, but on the continent of Europe, yeah, you have Freemasons definitely sort of siding with the American side. Now, you, Freemasons in England, um, you know, there was sort of this sort of wink-wink thing with uh, some of the American Freemasons. But w- what, what separates the American system from the English system, and it, it's a real long story. I'm going to try to do the best I can to answer this as, as short as possible, is w- within, within England, you have these first three degrees of Freemasonry, the entered apprentice fellow craft, master mason. Um, shortly after these degrees are, ri- are, are formulated, a Freemason writes this book called The Illustrations of Freemasonry. His name's William Preston, and this is very important. He's English, and he basically, uh, I'm making a real long story incredibly short, he basically says, when, when you become a Freemason, when you become a Blue Lodge Freemason, you are the most loyal subject of the crown. Um, now, the, because of this, and because of what the h- higher degrees associate which which is the french and the jesuits who are basically the two arch enemies of england high degree freemasonry never catches on in london and its surrounding environments now it does get popular in ireland and it does get popular in places like scotland but in in london high degree freemasonry even to this day is somewhat frowned upon in the united states high degree freemasonry becomes very popular because of course the french were our main allies during the revolution but after the revolution um, another uh, Mason comes along named Thomas Smith Webb, and he writes uh, a book with the exact same title called The Illustrations of Freemasonry. And he, he, he splits off from Preston, where he says that basically that, when, when, that, that as, as the Preston synthesis ends with the Mason becoming the most loyal subject to the king, the Smith uh, ritual, sy- ritual synthesis ends with the royal arts ceremonial which, if you understand the ritual, uh, the, the candidate possesses the name of God, the Tetragrammaton, and becomes a citizen priest king himself. So you do, do have this philosophical split between American Freemasonry, English Freemasonry, you know, and sort of the continental Freemasonry. Yeah, and that's interesting in relation to the biblical text, because technically those who believe are, you know, kings and uh, Oh, it's just slipped my my brain. Uh, we're right. kings and priests. We're kings and priests. So that you would have a right to, that where that's what you arrive to is interesting. Right. Well, because it's because um, in in the United States, the reason why the, the the ritual synthesis of Webb takes off is obviously we don't have a monarchy here. So the so it was basically how do you get around this? And the way the American Freemasons did it was it was twofold. It was through this where it was an embrace of these French continental degrees, um, which it's, it's called the way to perfection. It was 25 degrees. Um, it's developed by the Jesuits in the early 1740s. Um, it's midwifed in these, these rituals are midwifed into this country through Haiti. Um, and a right of perfection is set up um, by a man named Henry Franken in Albany, New York. Um, and, and this original high degree system is basically the godfather of what ultimately becomes the York and Scottish rights in America. But the, the web system ends with this royal arts ceremonial where the, where the initiate possesses the name of God and becomes a citizen priest monarch himself. Um, that varies from the Prestonian synthesis. Mm-hmm. But also um, the, the issue became, well, if we're not having a monarch anymore, um, you know, who do we replace as, as the monarch? 
and, and the answer, the question answers itself is, um, is, is basically George Washington is substituted for the English monarch, where Washington is viewed as sort of the solar Masonic godfather of the new nation. He, re- he really was. They really did uh, put him aside from everything else. And, uh, and it left its mark. Uh, can, I, can I try to change it a little bit, but stay on Freemasonry? Uh, can, you, can you explain the importance uh, of, the, of math teaching such as Euclid's? Uh, more specifically, <laughs> more specifically uh, the importance from uh, one to another of under, understanding the various ways of proving Euclid? Uh, maybe even uh, the you know the the perfection of the forty seventh proposition. Are you familiar with number forty seven? Well, right. That that's in Freemasonry. The forty seventh proposition of Euclid um, is the Pythagorean theorem. Um, you know, this is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Um, the the forty seventh proposition of Euclid is actually the um, emblem of a worshipful master. Um, in a Masonic Blue Lodge, um, the, the, the Pythagorean theorem is the symbol, uh, is the emblem, to, you know, of, of a Masonic worshipful master. Um, if, if, you know, just to split off a little bit from this, um, you know, you get into like, you know, Masonic symbology, you know, the guillotine is the 47th proposition of Euclid. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's the right triangle. And of course, you will find the 47th proposition of Euclid in the, in the federal triangle. Um, this is, you know, formulated by the White House, the Washington Monument, and the United States Capitol with, um, you know, the hypotenuse um, would be uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. And you get into some real deep royal arch esoterica here. You know, you, not only are you dealing with a solar emblem, you know, to, to, to groups like the Rosicrucians, the 47th proposition, the one side was Osiris, the other side was Isis, the hypotenuse was the perfected sun god Horus. Mm-hmm. Um, so you got a sol- you know, you got a solar emblem right off the bat. And of course, in the federal triangle, you have the hypotenuse would be Pennsylvania Avenue, which connects the two elected branches of our government, the executive and the Congress and the Senate. And of course, Pennsylvania is the keystone state. And the key, you know, key, a keystone is what formulates a, an archway. Right. Um, with, without it without a, yeah, without without a keystone, you can't have an archway. And there's a reason why Pennsylvania is called the Keystone State. Um, it's where it's it's it, it was in, within Philadelphia where the 13 stones became one arch um, and bound the country together. Basically, that's what a keystone does. I get into much more detail in the book, um, but yeah, the 47th proposition turns up in Blue Lodge Freemasonry as the emblem of a wor- wor- worshipful master. And I know uh, to s- stick with the Euclid and the uh, teachings of Pythagoras and on, and the importance of. Uh, I know there are a few people. Uh, I know Lincoln was was one who, when Lincoln was on his campaign trail. Uh, he, uh, he abandoned the campaign trail, went home for a month to his father's house. And this is the story, you know, this is where we all hear he read by candlelight and he read Euclid's elements and, and he was quoted, uh, saying you can never make a lawyer if you don't understand what demonstration means. And Euclid will bring that answer. And if I could leave the situation here in Springfield, and go home to my father's house and stay there till I could read the book thoroughly and I could understand and given any example in any proportion to the Euclid six books at sight. Uh, and Einstein swore to the book as his holy little geometry book. Uh, there's examples in Euclid that uh, if you could prove Luke, Euclid's elements, uh, you could basically prove anything. Isn't, isn't that the way it is? You could that prove would, it in every which way. You could apply that in, in any argument or any case, <laughs> therefore. Yeah, that, 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 that seems right. And, um, you know, we talked about it being the symbol of a Masonic worshipful master. It also filters into this royal arch degree um, and ties in with hermeticism, where in, this, in, the royal, in the underlying philosophy of the royal arch ceremonial, you know, you have the restoration of this antediluvian wisdom, the mathematics and the seven liberal arts, and um, you know it's it's uh, you know according to the Masonic lore, it's um, you know Pythagoras who who restores the forty seventh proposition back to you you know of Euclid back to humanity um, by correctly pronouncing the Tetragrammaton um, and restoring the mathematical pillar of Enoch um, you know back back to mankind. The math the uh, seven liberal arts pillar is restored by Hermes Trismegistus. 
Um, so yeah, you definitely see this from that, you know, not only with Euclid with the, the blue lodge, you'll see it in the higher degree with, um, you know, the restoration of this antediluvian wisdom. And, uh, it's it, it is a it is a big part in a lot, uh, and I, I know it's been teachings for a long time. And this is kind of I think where we run into. Uh, it, please forgive me for using these terms, uh, and, and I'm going to say just because it was j just recently I was uh, trying to speak uh, on this topic or at least close to it, and it it it, it turned into something uh, as, as satanic worshiping. Uh, uh, trying to call on all the, the evil spirits. Uh, do you deal with a lot of accusations on, on such a matter? And if so, how, how do you handle accusers that won't understand that uh, it's, it's simply for the act of improving oneself and nature? Yeah, I, no, I've, I've encountered it. Um, I've encountered it a couple times. Um, you know, it, it, I don't get really a whole lot on it, but I mean, I definitely have encountered it. Um, you know, I, I think one of the, the villains in all this within Freemasonry, um, and it, it has nothing to do. It has nothing to do with devil worship. And well, I mean, it, it, it's twofold, really. Is um, one is um, in in the Blue Lodge, you have something called the Blazing Star of Freemasonry, which is a pentagram. Um, and and you know, you know, Anton Lavey decides to use a pentagram, you know, for the Church of Satan. So all of a sudden, all the Freemasons who use a pentagram years beforehand. You know, right. you know, right, must be satanic also. I mean, this is total nonsense, of course. Yes. Um, right. it, 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 if you read Albert Pike, Pike will tell you that, that, that it, it's what, what it's representing is the Egyptian dog star Sirius, um, and this has to do with the Egyptian goddess Isis. And it's a long story, but the, the, the nexus that he's forming is it's, 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 it has to do with the third-degree Blue Lodge ritual where a candidate undergoes a symbolic death and, and is restored back to life. Um, and and w when this happens, the, the candidate is raised on what's called the five points of fellowship. Of course, the five points form the pentagram. And, mm -hmm. and, and Pike will tell you, well, this is representing this Egyptian goddess. And then you say, well, what, why that? Why this Egyptian goddess? Well, in Egyptian lore, Isis possessed the secret name of God. Um, that resurrected, uh, you know, the secret name of Amun Re. We don't know what it was, mm -hmm. but it was through the secret name that she was able to resurrect Osiris, the sire Horus. Well, it's the same thing going on with the Blue Lodge. You're, you're being brought back to life from undergoing the symbolic death. You know, being brought from darkness to light, um, and you know, you know, you, you, you know, it, 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 it's represented by a pentagram, which is meant to be this Egyptian dog star, but it has nothing to do with devil worship or and, Satanism. And the, it, and the it, pentagram, it, it's it's uh, it's very much involved with uh, geometry. It's 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 very, it's it's very very important there, and, uh, yeah, and there's mean, a lot I mean, more uh, on that end of it. Uh, you know, so many shapes come out of it, as uh, as you know, with the sacred geometry where. Things originate well, right. from I mean, the point, and uh, I mean, essentially, the five points of a star fits in within a circle, and, uh, and and thus we go on. I mean, it could be a geometry class at that point. But. Right. I mean, I mean, you know, you know, I mean, this, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, when you know, the pentagram was also a sacred symbol of Pythagoras. Um, you know, who who saw the four points as you know, earth, wind, you know, the four elements basically, right. and the fifth point was the ethereal, you know, element which symbolized mastery of the four. I mean, no, nothing, nothing harmful in that in any way. Um, and then, of course, you know, the better one that you know you, you definitely encounter more often um, is, of course, the Lucifer quotes. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. From from Albert Pike and Manley Hall, and even I talk about it in in the Royal Arch book. And of course, all these guys are talking about is that they're basically equating. Um, esoteric enlightenment, and of course the key word there is enlightenment with with the sun. And you know what they're saying is, you know Venus, the planet Venus rises in the morning occasionally, or more often than not, as this sort of you know you know as this announcer of the coming sunrise. And you know this is what Pike is saying: is it Venus or Lucifer that brings the light of the sun? Basically, all he's saying is, is it Venus that rises before the sun at the dawn? You know, doubt it not. But of course, if you substitute the word Venus with Lucifer, we wouldn't be talking about this years later. Lucifer sounds a lot more interesting, but all, all it is is an emblem for the sunrise, for esoteric enlightenment, and that, you know, Venus, a.k.a. Lucifer, the false light, is just announcing the true light of the world, the sun. That's all it is, and it's not mm. devil worship or anything like that. Right, back, back, and that takes us right back to the old masters again with Ficino and uh, the, the sun, the uh, appreciation, the respect 
for the daily world that we live in uh, was the uh, li- literally the son of God, uh, S-U-N. And, Correct. And, uh, you know, this was the, the hermetic teaching of the way. It was uh, S-U-N. Uh, but I understand because of uh, like Pike and a few other authors through the years have uh, changed things around a little bit through interpretation or on purpose. Uh, however, these with uh, the the light bearers, it's it's really been changed uh, a great deal. Where there was a time when uh, people really strived to be enlightened. Uh, they wanted that knowledge, that light. Uh, like someone like Facino again would say, you. Uh, ultimately inherit wisdom from uh, uh, respecting the sun and following its laws and, and things of this nature. Uh, it's it's a shame to me that it, it's it's taken such a strong, hard turn that a lot of people are very resistant uh, and, and uh, opposed to any idea of uh, any sort of light appreciation involved with, dare I say, religion. Uh, that it'd be taboo. Uh, usually, oh, yeah, if, if yeah. anything uh, I, involving I the appreciation the of is, light. I'm sorry, I, go I ahead. The problem with that is the, the dark side of man, because we can take anything that could have really an enlightening, world-shattering stuff, and we can turn it into something to just destroy the world. And that's the I think that's the double-edged sword that everybody dances on with this particular subject is... Yeah, it'd be nice to have all this wisdom, but mankind pretty much shows that it doesn't really take wisdom very well. Let's put it well, that way. Yeah, you got a good point there. Look what we did with uh, everything we learned from Einstein. Oh. You know, the uh, atomic I mean, bomb. It, you know, knowledge is great. It, it's really just uh, who's applying it. If it can't be monetized, it, right? then it gets, you know. Well, that's, it, it, that's a problem, but I mean, things like uh, Corpus Hermeticum and a, a lot of these works last for a very, very long time. Mm-hmm. And uh, w- without change, uh, but you know, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Robert. But an analogy that was given to me early on in relation was uh, if you're in a dark room uh, with no windows and it's pitch black, if you could light a match, just the simplest light could illuminate the entire room. However, there's nothing I can do in an instant to remove all the light from a room. And so, therefore, I wanted to strive for the light. I wanted to, 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 to fill with enlightenment as opposed right. to narrow, narrow myself. Well, what you'll see in Freemasonry with all this um, is, is the concept of being brought from darkness to light. And, you know, you get into the solar concept. And, you know, it's a controversial subject matter. I take it head on in the book. But, you know, just like within the Blue Lodge, you know, the Blue Lodge ritual, and, you know, it's carried forward in the Royal Arts Ceremonial, but, like, in the third-degree ritual, um, you know, and I, you know I, I'll just get into it real quick. I mean, it's, it's, a, sol- I mean, it's a whole thing. is just a solar allegory. Um, I mean, even the way the Lodge is set up, where you have the Worshipful Master sitting in the east as the rising sun, you've got the um, Junior Warden in the south as the sun in Meridian, and, of course, you've got um, the, the, the Senior Warden in the west as the setting sun, um, and, and, of course... You know, this this come. You read the works of Kircher and people like that. This is, of course, you know, God the Father at you know at, at dawn. You know, God the Son, the youthful Son at noon, and then you know descends into the ghostly afterworld at dusk, becoming you know the Holy Ghost or you know God you know God the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Trinity. Um, and this is, of course, coming from the Egyptian, um, at least according to Kircher. Um, but then you have in the Blue Lodge ritual where you have the the the, the, the sun the sun man here on who who is who is dead and resurrected, um, and you know you know you have um, you know he when he when he's dead he's buried west of the temple representing the dying or setting sun. Um, his grave is concealed with something called a sprig of acacia. That's um, a flower sacred to the sun god Apollo. When he is raised from the dead. Um, you know, he's raised on what's called the strong grip of a lion's paw. This is a reference to the constellation of Leo the lion, which is the sole house of the sun. And, you know, you're, 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 you're resurrected, you're dead and resurrected as the sun man. And, of course, this is paralleling um, the Egyptian, you know, Osirian cycle, I guess is the word I'm looking for. But then, of course, you will completely see, and I talk about it in the book, you know, the, the parallels with Christianity with this, you know, with the dying and resurrected sun god is, of course, Jesus Christ. 
Um, I mean, it's a controversial subject matter, but I've got a whole chapter on it in the uh, Royal Arch. You know, it is controversial. Uh, no doubt about it, and I'm and I'm glad you addressed that, <laughs> not, not, not <laughs> oh. myself. Uh, oh, how, I don't how, about. How, however, I mean, uh, one can't be observant on the similarities in, as we've already discussed, something uh, in old texts such as the Corpus Hermeticum. I mean, right. it just just that single text. There's an awful lot of there in that one book that uh, sure looks like it's been adapted by other religions. Well, sure. And then you have in the Blue Lodge, when Hiram Abiff is killed, King Solomon dispatches 12 fellow craft to go looking for the body. And of course, the 12 fellow craft, the 12 signs of the Zodiac going looking for the their lost solar ruler. You know, I mean, you know, where do you want to go from here? You have 12 tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you think they represent? I mean, you know, I mean, there have been numerous, you know, mystical writers. I mean, you know, not even Masonic who, who have talked about this before. Um, and then, of course, you know, you've got Christianity with Jesus as the Son, with the 12 houses of the Zodiac or the 12 apostles. Um, you know, you've got the whole thing with the death and resurrection, the whole symbolic allegory with the constellation of Virgo and Christmas Eve with the virgin birth. Um, and, I, you know, I, I talk about it much more extensively in the book, and it's definitely controversial. But, um, you know, I, I, I take it head on. And um, I mean, and, and that, that's the way I see it is, you know, you'll clearly see these astrological pa parallels you know, going on within, you know, these religions, the, 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 the awakening of the sun, you know, the rebirth of the sun being brought from light to dark, um, or excuse me, dark to light, um, you know, and you, you'll see this completely echoed in, in the Blue Lodge. And, and I, my take on it is completely astrological and astronomical. And, and you, you know, you're right. I mean, you know, you get into the Corpus Hermeticum, you'll definitely get into astrological magic, white cat, you know, white magic, the importance of astrology. You'll see this turning up in the works. You know, we taught you talk about Ficino and the Picatrix. This influences um, Tomoso Campanella, who was a Dominican friar. Um, and, you know, he wrote this Neoplatonic City of the Sun, which is this astrological, you know, utopian city, which in, in the Royal Arch, I, I suggest is the basically the most salient utopic reference for the federal district of Washington, D.C. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's definitely highly important. And I mean, I, I, I definitely kind of agree with what you're you know, hinting at that, you know, a lot of this, a lot of these guys and a lot of this information is lost or really not, you know, really taught anymore. It's almost you got to go out and find it for your own. Um, you know, I mean, th th that's at least that's at least what, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, you, you will you will find it. But, you know, a lot of it's not taught in a college classroom. Put it to like that. That's right. Or or at least you're you're not shown why you're taught it, where we could learn calculus and, and we could learn Pythagoras and the history. You get the foundation for all these tools, but it's really how you put them all together and you use yeah. it. But, you, you know, uh, I think I was. When I asked the last question, it was it related to the prior in the sense that it's it's ironic to me at times how uh, one could see the correlations from original teachings and how they were ad adapted by others and, and influenced. And, and I understand and respect that. However, I do see it quite ironic how uh, religions could uh, borrow or adapt uh, and, and then turn a spin saying – you know, uh, this is satanic. This is devil worshiping. Where, in the sense, one one might want to suggest hey, the tracing thing, the originals, it? right? I yeah, mean, right. It's the look same. Look where thing. it's come from. I, I say that with everything is go to the original source. Just go to it. Right. Uh, don't tell me uh, you heard it from uh, Thomas Paine wrote it or the King James version of the Bible. Let's go back to the beginning. You know, even before Vulgate. You know, uh, you got to you got to go back the to the secret. originals. I I think it's like the secret mystique that hangs over it because I think most people feel that, you know, what's the truth and, you know, for everybody to see is out in the open and the stuff that's the lie and can't be seen is kept in the shadows. And I think that these type of lot, maybe, you know, lodges of, you know, varying names and stuff. Uh, well, that, that might, that that might have. Some, they're doing something sneaky behind the doors, you know? So. Well, I think this uh, might have a lot. And Robert, uh, 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 please, if you could help me on this, this might have a lot to do with why secret, why they were formed as secret societies in, in general in in the beginning when it was originated uh, in Europe. The uh, free religious practices uh, were were uh, not so much uh, they, they were. <laughs> you, you, 
you 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 couldn't do it. That's is what crazy. I'm getting at. It's <laughs> you know uh, you you had you had to follow in line, and any ideas were very uh, heretical. Well, what you have, what you kind of have going on, at least with like some of these religions, is you know if if you go back and read a lot of the early church fathers, especially within Christianity, you know a lot of these guys talk about this. Um, you know, like Origen. I mean, he's one of the chief compilers of the New Testament. Um, you know, he, he talks about Christianity having this sort of, you know, hidden, hidden, you know, alternative meaning that, you know, is not to be written down and things like that. And of course, you will see within incorporating into Christianity a lot of these elements of, of the mystery schools, um, you know, concepts of, you know, death and resurrection. I mean, you'll find that in the Egyptian Osirian, um, you know, mysteries, um, the Aleutian mysteries. This all predates Christianity. But then, you know, I think, I think, kind of what you're asking me is, you know, you have this, and then is this secret knowledge being passed down? Um, and it does seem to be that way. You have these groups that do seem to be the keepers of the, of these esoteric truths. You know, you go back um, to like the, you know, to the Gnostics, I'm thinking, then you go to the Cathars, um, and then you get into to, to the, you know, these groups, um, you know, like the Knights Templars, um, who, who clearly, in my opinion, discovered something over in the Holy Land. Um, my, my, my take on it is um, whether it was material wealth, it's possible, but I definitely believe they came into Kabbalistic knowledge, certainly mathematical knowledge. They returned to Europe. Um, you know, all of a sudden these mathematically precise cathedrals are springing up all, all over the place, aligned to the solstices and the equinoxes. You know, that's no coincidence. Then you've got, you know, not only do you have the Templars, then you get into these other groups. Um, you can throw the Rosicrucians into this, who seem yeah. to have understanding of this hermetic knowledge. I, the you know, Teutonic I, Knights this, are in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I definitely put put the Society of Jesus up there. You read the works of Kircher. These guys, the, these these guys were in the know on all this. Um, then you get into, of course, the Freemasons, you know, and I dare use this word, the Illuminati, um, you know, which was a real group. It doesn't seem to exist anymore, but, you know, well, it does guys to are, some people. <laughs> it does to some people. Um, but, you know, these guys seem to be incorporating a lot of the mysteries of Pythagoras to formulate a new world. Um, so, you know, you know, yeah, you, you know, I definitely see this sort of almost handing down of this, um, you know, like lost, you know, secret wisdom. Um, you know, and, and it seems to be incorporated into um, Freemasonry, at least in the rituals. You know, if you had asked me this question with Masonic rituals probably 14 years ago, you know, after I became one, I mean, my, my take on all this would have been, you know, it's just a, it's just a lot of rituals based on the Bible or other religious traditions that that, that, that how wrong I was. Um, you know, these rituals are, are, are incorporating these hermetic secrets um, concepts coming out of Gnosticism, concepts coming out of these ancient Mediterranean mystery schools. You know, you will find elements of Zoroastrianism in this again, oh, yes. Gnosticism, the light versus dark. Um, and again, in the higher degrees. And, you know, you know, you, you get into this royal art ceremony, I'll just um, make this short, is, you know, it, 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 the, the ritual revolves around the discovery of this treasure vault on, on the Temple Mount. Um, you know, you know, in in the ceremonial, it's by temple builders constructing the second temple. But in earlier workings of it, it's discovered by a coterie of Roman Catholic Knights Templars. And you just really start to have to ask yourself: I mean, is is this ritual trying to re relate some sort of real yet you know lost history? Um, and, and, it, and it seems to be that way. I mean, you know, you look at it more and more. At least I do. There definitely seems to be something to this. Well, you know, it's funny because I also see the time of the First Crusade uh, on the west of Europe, Iberian Peninsula, uh, where there's a lot of Arabic uh, 11th century texts that are just arriving. And uh, I, was, I just shared some with Tim C. here from the program where, uh, you know, uh, Leonardo da Vinci did all his studies on optics and, and eyes and, and, the, and the workings of which, and he did drawings of them, and he's well attributed for, for this. And I just sent some images to Tim, and he said, you know, this is incredible, that this, but this doesn't look like Leonardo's writing. And I said, no, it's it's literally the same drawing, but this is from the 11th century, and it's it's from Arab. It came from Constantinople. You know, right. uh, you know this is when the, the Crusades are happening on the, the West side. Not only do we see the appearance of ancient texts that are in, in, in Arabic needs to be translated still, but you're, you're dead on. This is when I see uh, – 
arches appear in cathedrals and uh, yeah. to, to any extent you could build them to any height you want so as long as you follow the math right as long as you follow yeah. the proportions you could build that uh that dome as large as you want and you know you know when you get into the templars also um with with, with all this there definitely seems that the templars play more of an important role in the higher degree system than they do in blue lodge freemasonry but there does seem to be this um templar influence on the blue lodge and and it's coming from the most weirdest source um you you will find elements of sufism um in robert, blue lodge freemasonry. robert i don't mean yeah. to cut you off but we gotta head to a break i'm real sorry everyone please stick around we'll be right back yeah. with mr robert sullivan talk more on free freemasonry and then cinema symbolisms Welcome back to Researchers Radio Live. Your host Joe Kiernan and Dave Stinnett. We have Mr. Robert Sullivan here. Robert Sullivan the Fourth. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, all right. we're, we're discussing the Royal Arch of Enoch and soon to be cinemas symbolisms. Uh, before I get straight too far, uh, Mr. Sullivan, there's a few things that came in regarding the topics of uh, UFOs and okay. Uh, now. We also spoke earlier on Giordano Bruno, and Giordano Bruno, uh, so everyone knows out there, uh, he was he was a serious hermetic, and uh, I I would say anyone who's a true hermetic would be serious. Uh, they usually take it so serious uh, that they're usually away from everyone else, thus being a hermit or a hermit crab, hermetic crab, if you will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, Giordano Bruno, uh, everyone at home, was a fascinating individual, uh, very intelligent. He wrote a fantastic book, but not the first to write on the topic of the art of memory, uh, the, the art of a lot of things. Uh, he was uh, so, so well-versed and able to practice his memory that he, uh, when he was just introduced into the, uh, the Catholic Church, he impressed everyone right up the lines through cardinals and eventually caught the word of the Pope. And he was asked to go to Rome to demonstrate uh, this uh, keen sense of memory he had. And he left an impression on the Pope. And Giordano Bruno uh, was ultimately imprisoned by the Inquisition, held for, <laughs> he held, held for seven years and, okay. and burned alive. Uh, most likely Galileo was there. Galileo... Uh, Knew, knew him. Uh, they, uh, this went through the Medici's. Galileo was a teacher of the, the Medici children. Uh, as we were talking about earlier, there is a long line of this. This information and these teachings and these beliefs uh, went on through uh, right up into uh, Newton. And as Galileo said, the person who's going to discover the laws of gravity, it's going to be uh, a, a, it's going to have to be a fantastic alchemist. And thus Newton was that man. Uh, but Giordano Bruno uh, believed in a lot of things, and he was, uh, he was accused of being a little bit crazy. Um, I, I don't see him so much like that. Uh, I, I, I see why people say it, because he wrote a few books, and uh, one of the books I, I like a lot, it's 10 pages long, and it, I believe it's just one or two sentences. It's, it's just like a thousand commas. He's just on a rant. He's just giving you example after example after example. And he might have seemed a little crazy, but uh, to this person, this is someone who was seeing things a little bit different. And he was able to, in his own words, he could give 100 examples every day for the rest of his life, uh, uh, proving things in such a way. 
Now, Giordano Bruno also adamantly believed that not only is there life beyond Earth, that he felt that life, it had to be there uh, based upon uh, the comparison to Earth to uh, measuring as far away as he can and measuring as small. Uh, we still do this today. Uh, he was uh, very assertive in his beliefs, and, and he really thought that this was, like I said, not just a possibility that it was uh, – it had to be life just had to be somewhere else just as much as it was here uh mr sullivan in regards to the topics of ufos and whatever else might be involved whether uh some uh, beings or not uh within or in control uh how how is your stand or the stand in freemasonry involving uh the, the possibility of life beyond this planet well, it, within there, there would be, I'll answer your question twofold. Um, one is there would really be no official stance within the masonry as an organization, but it's basically would be up to the individual mason um, what they believe. Um, I mean, I don't think Freemasonry takes an official stance. However, I will say this: you will find something very interesting in the works of Thomas Smith Webb, um, and it regards Bruno. Um, yeah, I mean, my personal belief is. Um, you know, I mean, I, I find it next to impossible to believe that we are the only inhabited planet in this vast universe. Um, and I definitely believe there has to be life elsewhere in this universe. Um, I mean, that, you know, th that I definitely, you know, am one. I mean, I definitely believe that 100 um, percent. This actually filters into Freemasonry, um, the works of Bruno. Um, and I get these these backwards from time to time. So you're going to forgive me. But um, in, in, in Thomas Smith Webb, who, who's a, one of the premier um, American ritualists, he's the godfather of what's known as the York Rite. That's uh, the other high degree system. The Scottish Rite's one, York Rite's the other. In Thomas Smith's Webb illustration, he actually um, cites Bruno. Um, he doesn't quote him directly, but he, he, you know, Bruno talked about, you know, the Copernican theory of there being an, an infinity of worlds out there. And basically, you know, as, as Bruno thought that, you know, each individual star could or was a star or excuse me, was a sun. And that sun had planets revolving around it, like our solar system. And there was probably life on them. Um, I want to, you say he used the word plurality of worlds or infinity of worlds. I can't remember which one it's one or the other. I'm willing to uh, bet it was well, infinity. No, in the, <laughs> no, yeah. you might be right, but he just, the, he's on the edge. But, but I know, I know Thomas Smith Webb says this exact same thing in his illustrations. He says he's, he talks about the in masonry in order to become a Freemason, you have to believe in um, a Supreme being, a God, um, you know, or God, you know, a God deity. Um, and this is in Freemasonry. It's generally called the great, great architect of the universe or the grand geometrician. Um, and, and Webb actually says this in his illustration. He says, well, if you look up at, uh, I'm going to, screw the quote up but it's basically something to the effect of you know that the, these other stars these, these are an, uh, an infinity or plurality of worlds all under the protection of the great architect of the universe and clearly what web is getting this from um giordano bruno and um you know so you will you will find in in masonry in this masonic literature and again this is uh, a, a big thomas smith webb in american freemasonry is a huge deal um he, you know, like I said, he's the godfather of the York Rite. Um, you will actually find this reference to um, not UFOs per se, but um, extraterrestrial life um, and, you know, being under the protection of this uh, grand geometrician. So, you, yeah, you will find it actually turn up in, um, you know, in, in Masonic literature. It, it has before. Uh, now, Heather from the chat room typed that she thinks they build the large arches so uh, large beings can enter through them. Now, uh, that I think we were just going through that, but that leads me to ask uh, something else in regards to uh, America, uh, with Freemason right. here in America. Uh, you know, a lot of people think that the the archway in St. Louis, the archway to the west, is really just a coincidental design for whatever reason to lead people to the west uh is there any importance of the arch being in st louis with the well, it, uh, bush it, family and uh starting uh, budweiser and all this there 
well, I don't know if it has anything to do with the Bush family, but it, 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 I, I get into the symbology of the um, Gateway Arch. Um, it has to do with um, the, it, it's a long story, but it has to do with the first Catholic church um, that sits um, right underneath of it, or it used to. I think they moved the archdiocese, um, which was a replication of the Baltimore Basilica, um, which was the first um, archdiocese of, in the United States. And what, what, it, what it actually is symbolizing is um, it ties in with the Erie Canal, which was masonry's westward expansion. Um, when the canal system opened, um, it was actually blessed with a royal archway. It was blessed in a royal arch ceremonial. Um, and, of course, what it was linking was the Masonic Empire State to the Great Lakes and ultimately the Mississippi Delta and uh, Gulf of Mexico. And when they opened the Erie Canal, um, they did it with this royal arch ceremony and they actually built an uh, actual wooden archway over the one of the lock systems. And it's a long story, but it has to do with um, this treatise that was published right around this time by a Freemason named Salem Town, who talked about the expand, uh, expansion, expanding masonry westward was expanding um, this royal arch word, um, which is, you know, logos of the gospel of St. John. Logos. And basically, yeah, you were, you were expanding this westward and they created this, um, this archway over it. And you actually see this come to life with this St. Louis Royal archway, which is the gateway to the West, which is actually, um, astrologically and Kabbalistically aligned to the statue of Liberty in mm -hmm. New York Harbor. Um, I get into more detail on that in the, um, in the book. Yeah, thank you. I know it was uh, a lot to go into, but I, I wanted you to uh, to mention a little bit of the archway because it's it you know it's more it's not even so much that I meet a lot of people that uh, don't understand its meaning. They they just forget it's there altogether. Like it's just a national monument. It has no meaning. It, uh, right. No significant of design or and and you know by design uh, I mean more than just the design of the structure itself. It's the location. It's it's everything. The, the design oh, is usually seven layers deep. You know, it's 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 no coincidence. Oh, yeah. It's not a choice. It's, no, this stuff is highly, highly Kabbalistic and, and numerological and astrological. Um, you will see replicate, you know, you will see the gateway arch. You will see, you know, you have in the United States some um, three replications of, of three of the ancient wonders of the world, the man-made. You have the Statue of Liberty, which is um, the um, the Colossus of Rhodes. You have the mm -hmm. Scottish Rite Temple in Washington, which is the Mausoleum of Helicarnassus, and one of my favorites is the um, George Washington Masonic Memorial in Alexandria, Virginia, which is of course a replication of the Alexandria Lighthouse. And if you look at the Alexandria Washington Memorial, it's a lighthouse. It's actually modeled after. This is why it sits in Alexandria, Virginia. It's a reference to Alexandria, Egypt. They're both lighthouses that spread, you know, light. You know, here we go again. Um, so, yeah, you will you will see, um, you know, I mean, you, you'll see this. You know, I get into it more in depth in the book. You know, you will see Masonic symbolism going on with the Erie Canal. You'll see it in the uh, architecture of the federal district. You'll see it in Baltimore, Maryland, with the um, Baltimore Basilica and the Robert Mills Washington Monument. Um, yeah, you know, you know, when you when you get the symbolic eye for it, um, you definitely begin to see, like you say, it's seven layers deep a lot of times. Um, you know, the alignments and things like that. Yeah. Now, with there was something that I, I would like to take to your your upcoming book. I'll try to segue over to that. Uh, oh yeah. Tim sent me a message uh, here while we were discussing it, and it was in uh, in relation to your upcoming project, and. You know, there's something that my children, I have two children that are uh, 10 and one is nine and I have one that's very young. But since my the two older ones were about uh, six or seven, they've they've been pretty good with math. Uh, I've, not tough on them. Uh, they, they, they see the fun with it when it's presented right. Uh, one of the best things I did, which made it fun for them, was uh, – there's uh, people at home, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, maybe if you could recall back when you were younger, and maybe in grade school, uh, we were all shown, or on Saturday morning, we were all shown Walt Disney's cartoon with Donald Duck basically uh, teaching sacred geometry, and he takes the role of Pythagoras for the episode. And, uh, and this being because uh, someone who is uh, Walt Disney was well-achieved as a Mason, and like a lot of Masons before them that perfected their art, uh, they became a master 
And this is when they perfected their art and were able to impose symb symbolisms and hidden messages, maybe for key people, uh, the design to place these without the intent for everyone finding them. Uh, that was usually the most work they put into it. Uh, the, the quality of the work of art uh, usually was a result of being crafty with numbers. And I know this was the case for uh, Walt Disney himself, who was a, an accomplished mason. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your upcoming project here, your work that's soon to be released, uh, Cinema's uh, Symbolisms? And uh, can, can you lead us through a, a little bit of the story you take us through? Yeah, absolutely. And um, let me let me just say right off the bat, um, the book is yeah, the book is called Cinema Symbolism, a guide to esoteric imagery in popular movies. Uh, this is a continuation of um, of the final chapter of the Royal Arch of Enoch, where I get into some of the solar Masonic and, you know, even Enochian symbolisms in, in some movies like National Treasure, um, Being There, the Da Vinci Code movie, which is numerological all over the place. Um, and this book del delves into, I'm actually, the Walt Disney material, you're correct, I'm actually writing right now its sequel called Cinema Symbolism 2, which I'm delving into the Walt Disney stuff with like Fantasia, where you have Mickey Mouse doing the Kabbalistic magic and, you know, as the sorcerer's apprentice. Um, but let me make this announcement um, that Cinema Symbolism will be available for pre-order um, in the next 48 hours through my publisher's website. Um, which is rsplaunchpad.com. Um, I'm going to plaster this all over my website, which is robertwsullivaniv.com. I'll put it all over my social media. But you will be able to pre-order um, Cinema Symbolism within the next um, couple days. Um, book will ship mid to late June, but you know, and these will be signed copies of the book as well. So if you want a copy of this um, and you want a signed copy, this will be sold exclusively through uh, my publisher, which is, again, rsplaunchpad.com. And um, th th this link will be provided on my social media, my website in the next 48 hours, 72 at the latest. And just one other side note on that is um, coming later in this week, we will also start selling signed copies of the Royal Arch to the publisher. Um, these will be copies signed by me. Um, and if you want them, these are sold exclusively through um, rsplaunchpad.com um, just in time for Father's Day. So I'll have more news on that at the end of the week. But again, just keep in touch on my website and my social media. And again, my website's robertwsullivaniv.com. But yeah, Cinema Symbolism. Um, we'll, yeah, get this a, is we'll, a, we'll put that on the website and uh, we'll get that. And we'll get to the, the sites again. I really want everyone to get the upcoming work and and his signed copy. I know I am. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, well, Robert. Go ahead. Uh, no, no, that's okay. Yeah, I'll I'll throw it out again at the end of the at the end of the yeah, program. Yeah, we'll get no, to this, it for um, sure. this, this 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 book is a continuation of this final chapter, and um, I'm writing its sequel right now, which is titled Cinema Symbolism Two, which I'm doing the Walt Disney movies, uh, or some of them, any rate. But this book. Um, when I was doing Royal Arch, I found a lot of like um, solar iconography in the Arthurian ledger, main, legend mainly through the Excalibur movie, which is one of the best tellings of the Arthurian legend from a solar astrological standpoint. Um, the Being There movie with Peter Sellers is again another solar, you know, journey type of uh, movie. Um, the National Treasure movie, the first one, is uh, the Royal Arch ritual. Um, if you want to see it in a, in a, in a movie setting or in a, in a, on the big screen, watch National Treasure. It's the rest. It's the recovery of the treasure vault underneath the holy ground. You know, the the, the Masonic treasure vault. Basically, this is what the Royal Arch ceremonial documents. Um, and then, of course, I did the Ninth Gate with Johnny Depp, which is cabalistic from start to finish. So this movie, I talk. Or this next book, excuse me. Um, I took this forward. Forward, and I get into some of the symbolism. Um, I mean, you know, my God, where do you want to start? Um, you know, the, uh, the well, Matrix I know, trilogy. I know you yeah. have. Oh, well, we could do Matrix. I, I, I was interested, be, and I, I have to be when I look at uh, the the cover for the book. I have to ask about Back to the Future when you you have it oh, front and center. Yeah, the, oh yeah, the Back to the Future has some really great stuff going on in that. Um, the first one has the most. Um, and the, the, the second one has some, and the third one is more of a role reversal, but has some hidden stuff in it. But yeah, back to the future. Um, it's really, if, if you, if you pay attention to it, um, you've got a lot of solar symbolism going on in this. You have a lot of the Egyptian mythology going on in this, where you have, um, you know, the concept of the Osirian, um, cycle where you have Osiris who was killed and resurrected in, in the back to the future movie this would be the character of george mcfly who is 
dead in part and who's killed in part two and is ultimately resurrected. He, of course, births his solar son, Marty McFly. Um, and the, the virgin mother would be Lorraine Baines. And of course they're doing battle with Biff Tannen. And of course, Biff Tannen's last name is of course, all but phonetically, you know, Typhon, which is the Egyptian God of darkness. And you, you will see these, um, you know, these concepts going on with the sun chariot where the, the, the car has to hit 88 miles an hour, um, to, to, to turn it into the, the fire sun chariot to break the space time continuum. And this is one of the most adroitly concealed numerological symbolisms you'll ever find in a movie is, um, is, is is at the end when when they're on top of the clock tower, um, the, the lightning strikes it at 10:04, and this is when 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 Doc Brown, who who is your you know Hermes you know <laughs> you know you know magician Ben Franklin type character who's harnessing the lightning from the heaven, yeah. um, we're told 10:04 10:04 10:04, um, and this is a solar reference. Um, it's not only is it a time, but it's also a date. Um, 10:04 is October 4th which is, I want to say, uh, is around like the 264th day of the year, which means there are 88 days left. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, why the sun chariot is activated at 88 miles an hour um, and, you know, spits fire. And there's a lot more going on in Back to the Future. Um, in part two, um, you know, you have the concept of the dead and resurrected dead sun man. Um, you have the girlfriend who, you know, if Marty is sort of the sun child, you have the, 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 the girlfriend, Jennifer, and of course, uh, the name Jennifer is a German hardened version of Guinevere, who of course is the moon, um, is, you know, the, the lunar goddess or, you know, Guinevere was the lunar queen or the white queen to King Arthur, the sun. So you have the lunar reference with her. Um, and then of course you have, um, the concept of the master of space time, which is Doc Brown. Um, and if you're familiar with tarot cards, um, you have the Hierophant card, which is the fifth card of the tarot of the major arcana. And th that card associates with um, mastery of the hermetic sciences and mastery of space time. And if you read Aleister Crowley's book on the tarot, he tells you, well, the Hierophant is the master of space time, the fifth, fifth card. And of course, this is when Brown is the number five is November 5th, 1955 is when he discovers the flux capacitor. Um, so you, you'll find Brown surrounded by the number five all over the place. Um, and, you know, Back to the Future has lots of uh, great solar references in it, um, a lot of Egyptian symbols in it. Um, you know, you got Biff Tannen um, in part two riding around in the Luxor, you know, taxi cab, which is a reference to uh, Luxor, Egypt. Um, this is again echoing these Egyptian mysteries, which you'll find in the um, in, in, in the uh, in the in the uh, movie. And then you also find Brown um, on on another level, and you'll see this. You'll see these guys turn up occasionally um, in film are the United States presidents, um, where like for example, the Wizard of Oz is William McKinley, um, and of course Doc Brown is um, is a symbol for Ronald Reagan, who was president at the time. I mean, right. and they're the, they're the same characters, um, both Reagan and Brown battle Libyan terrorists. Both, both of them survive assassination attempts. Um, it's funny, too, because uh, the, I believe he even mocks Reagan in the first one. If I'm he not mocks sure. Reagan in the film. Yeah. And, the uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> right. And then, and then you know, Brown and Reagan, Reagan achieves presidency in the 80s. And, of course, Brown discovers time travel in the 80s. But despite their achievements of the 1980s, Brown and Reagan are today only remembered of legends of the old West. So you'll, you'll find parallels there with Reagan and Zemeckis um, who directed back to the future likes to play around with the presidents. Um, Forrest Gump is Bill yeah, Clinton. Yeah. Um, you know, you'll, you'll see, you'll see the presidents turn up from, from time to time. But yeah, I've got a whole chapter on the three back to the future movies. Um, and I do the wizard of Oz uh, movie, which has uh, two real deep, um, levels of symbology on it. One's a political me metaphor and the other is the initiation into the mystery tradition. Um, uh, what's some of the other Star Wars? Um, I do all six of the Star Wars movies, which is the Joseph Campbell monomyth um, for the for part one, really. You'll see elements in part two. Good God, the Matrix movies are Gnosticism 101. I mean, <laughs> I, I, mean I, I, think, you know, I think it was yeah. just yesterday that I was having a discussion in relation to uh, your what you're you were just comparing uh, the situations with the Wizard of Oz, I think I was just telling Tim a lot of this stuff right. on on 
how obvious it is to me, you know, uh, right. knowing a lot of these older texts, so how uh, I say, like, how comical this is, you know, uh, the it, comical in the sense that a great deal of thought and planning went into it. And, and yet all this time and, and such a small percentage of people are still getting it, you know, well, it's that, it, that to me is a, is a great plan. That's, that's a good yeah. piece of art. And, and a lot of times, and, and often is the case, as you were talking about, like Walt Disney being well familiar with this stuff. I mean, I mean, if you want to just watch just an occult festival, take a look at Fantasia. I mean, that thing, you know, I mean, even, you know, and even the one part, and I just put this on one of the Facebook page. I mean, the night on Bald Mountain is satanic all but, um, you know, I mean, so you'll see a lot, you'll, you'll see a lot in the, and then Disney also um, produced the National Treasure movies. And Disney also put out, um, you know, you get into these really, you know, kind of concepts of um, witchcraft and, um, you know, you know, metaphysical, uh, uh, alchemical manipulation in these movies they produced in the 1970s called Return to Witch Mountain and Escape from Witch Mountain, um, you know, which which are overloaded with mysticism in it and, and you know, uh, ESP and telekinesis and, you know, really, you know, overloaded with occult themes. Um, oh, yeah, The Wizard of Oz. Um, Baum, the guy who wrote it, uh, L. Frank Baum was in, was, was in Madame Blavatsky's Theo Theosophy Society. I did not know so, that. Oh really? yeah. Yes. Yeah. So he, he was well-versed, um, with this and, and, and what, what you have, you have, you have three levels of symbolism going on with the Wizard of Oz. One is what you would call your profane explanation, which this is just about a girl who gets transported to this magical land, has this adventure, goes home and the movie, you know, that's your, you know, your, what Albert Pike would describe as your explanation for the, you know, profane masses. Right. That's the then arc you, of the story, if you will. <laughs> right. Right. But then you've got, you've got the two others, you've got the initiatic, um, the mystery school initiatic um, tradition going on where, you know, it, it's a little different in the book but you have clearly, you know, where she's being transported up the tornado, which is this sort of winding staircase, um, you know, the, the staircase of ascension. You want to call it the ladder of Mithras or Minerva. Um, you know, when she gets to Oz, um, the two good witches, it's in the movie, there's only one, but the two good witches that help her are the horizontal, um, excuse me, the vertical witches, the witches of the north and south, which represent Gnostic ascension, you know, or, or apotheosis. These are the ones who are ch helping her achieve her enlightenment. The two witches that are work well, the one witch, the one gets killed. The witches who, who are working against her, the evil witch. These are the horizontal, you know, black cabalistic magicians who are the east and west. This is stagnation. This is mm -hmm. non-ascension. Um, and then, of course, you've got um, the concept in in the book. Um, where you have the yellow brick road is, of course, the solar path, the golden path of enlightenment. In the book, the slippers are, are, are silver. This represents, you know, the moon, you know, the sacred feminine, you know, mm -hmm. Dorothy's own femininity. You have her leading, you know, this would lead her to the demiurge, you know, or this false creator, the phony god who is Oz. Um, and, of course, you know, you have the, the, the wicked witch, um, in the book, it's different than in the movie where in the book, the witch is a cyclops um, and she, 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 she can purview the entire land of Oz from her, from atop her tower. Now, if that sounds familiar, you'll see this turn up in J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings with Barad-dûr, where, where in Mordor, where um, the eye of Sauron can see the entire land. This is the same sort of theme going on with, with, with in the Wizard of Oz. And then, of course, she, you know, uh, is able to, you know, understand, receive a revelation that there's, you know, quote unquote, no place like home, and you know, has her enlightenment. And you know, the 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 the, de the, the demiurge, sort of the lesser god, is taking her back in the. You know, you know, if you want to say he kind of represents organized religion, um, you know, which, of course, the mystery traditions, you know, and even today, you know, we're always wary of is taking her, you know, back in the hot air balloon. And of course, you know, the, the, the idea is that the religions are hot air. There's nothing to right. them. Um, so you'll see that that level of symbology. There's even more to it. I've got it much more in the book. But then you also have, of course, the political allegory where um, Dorothy, the name Dorothy is a palindrome for Theodore, Dorothy backwards is Theodore and she's Theodore Roosevelt. The, the Wizard of Oz is William McKinley who lives in Emerald City, which is paper money. 
and the yellow brick road is the gold standard that leads to the creation or inflation of paper money. And its negative side to this is, of course, the green witch, the green money, which is inflation. This is the evil side. And, of course, you have the, the, the tin man, who is the laborers um, of, of the United States. The scarecrow would be the farmers. And then the cowardly lion would be, um, you know, Eugene Debs or William Jennings Bryant. This is the democratic socialists who are all bark but no bite. And, um, you know, the yellow brick road would be the gold standard that leads to the creation of paper money or the or Emerald City. So, yeah, you'll see an entire um, political allegory also going on in um, The Wizard of Oz. I uh, last time I watched it with my children, uh, I was discussing how where she lived her Dorothy was living her day to day life. Uh, you know, it was it, the film was black and white. It was it was a, a dull, mundane uh, impression that was given. She wasn't happy, you know, and and right. then when she's in the new land, you know, everything is following geometric proportions and it's all in colored there. You know, it's all uh, it's enlightened and and uh, and it was it, I loved it so much because my children are getting aware, recognizing the geometric patterns where when the Wicked Witch of the West, the house landed on her. That her when her her feet and her legs rolled up on themselves, my my daughter recognized. She said, "Look, there's the golden spiral." And I said, "I'm so proud of you." That sounds. Thank you for recognizing that. Yeah. But uh, it's the, it, it was I, a good yeah. example of lightness and darkness, and uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, it was a, a classic film, and uh, it's it's still going to impress people days to come. You're gonna you have a lot to to speak about that and. And I really hope people pick up your book about this one, man. Uh, yeah, because um, yeah. this this is this is just phenomenal stuff. Because people, you're speaking about movies that people are very familiar with, and think they, they some of these people might even uh, know these movies line for line. You know, think they they know it through and through. And there's a lot of these messages. So, what other movies do you get to get into here? Yeah, um, I do the um, I do the entire Omen trilogy. I do the Exorcist movie. There's some there's some really interesting go things going on in that one. Um, I do I have oh of course the James Bond movies. Good God, where do you want to start with those? Um, <laughs> you know you know you got John D zero zero seven himself. Um, you know I mean I don't know if you know if you're aware of this. Um, the guy who wrote the James Bond books, Ian Fleming, was he, he was Alistair Crowley's handler in British in British intelligence. Um, I mean, you you just got a lot going on. Um, I mean, a lot of a lot of Gnostic Rosicrucian themes going on in um, James Bond. Of course, the zero zero seven sigil is the signature of John D. Um, who was Queen Elizabeth's court magician and, and one of Walsingham's spies, and when he would sign a correspondence to her. The signature was two it was eyeglasses it was 007 with the line over the eyeglass. And um, the, the sigil meant that the correspondence was for her eyes only. And this is, of course, where you get the espionage term for your eyes only. And um, F Fleming incorporated that, making Bond 007. But you'll, you will clearly see Gnostic and, you know, what I call Rosicrucian themes in this, where you have Bond, who is the sun hero, you know, what happens? He meets with M, who gives him his assignment. Well, M is his ruler, you know, and M is the 13th letter of the, uh, the alphabet. And this, of course, denotes solar rulership with the sun ruling over the 12 houses of the zodiac. That's usually what the number 13 stands for. And then what does he do? He goes and meets Hermes Trismegistus, who is Q, or the quartermaster, who gives him the sacred piece of wisdom, which is the gadget that winds up saving his life. And then we have the Rosicrucian alchemical wedding occur, where he meets the Bond girl, or the moon, um, who, who then equips him with the necessary, you know, alchemical wedding to go on and defeat the demiurge-like villain. Um, and these guys are all, you know, I mean, all out of history tradition. Hugo Drax, the dragon, Ernst Stavro Blofeld, who wants to take over the world, who, you know, this is the Illuminati guy. You've got the alchemical magician, Goldfinger, who wants to do nothing but transmute gold. Um, you've got Scaramanga, who wants to use the sun rays, the man with the golden gun. Um, uh, who are some of the other ones? Good God. Um, oh, you got the voodoo priest, the guy who uses the voodoo black magic, Mr. Big, um, in, in, uh, in live and let die. Um, and you know, the, you know, it, it's, it's the same theme over and over again. And of course, you know, uh, Fleming 
was well versed with this. He was Alistair Crowley's handler um, in, in British intelligence. And you, you'll see these little clues come up from time to time. Um, I mean, one, one of them was Auric, or, you know, Goldfinger's first name is Auric. AU is the alchemical symbol for gold. And then you've got Goldfinger, who, who doesn't want to steal the gold. He wants to transmute it. It's, it's alchemy. Um, and then you've got, um, you, know, you know, he's got the uh, Philosopher's Stone which is the nuclear dirty bomb, which is going to transmute the gold in Fort Knox to make it worthless while increasing his gold supply. That's alchemy. Now, if you really understand the, 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 these guys who are making these movies, when it comes to the, 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 these alchemical movies, and Goldfinger's one of them, and Goldfinger's one of the godfathers of them, um, we, 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 to the alchemists, there were these four colors that symbolize you know, alchemical transition, you had the negredo, which is the black or the you know the Saturn or the melancholy. Then you had the citronatus, citronitis, which is the yellow sun. Then you had the albedo, which is the white or the lunar. And then of course you had the complete the completion of the alchemical process, which was the rubido or the red. The red symbolizes alchemical completion. Or, you know the magnum opus is over. In Goldfinger, you will have the um, the black melancholia, the death character who is odd job, who wears the black tuxedo and uses the hat as the flying guillotine. Then you have, you know, the citronatus, which is, of course, Bond when the golden Fort Knox represented. And then you'll have the moon, who is the Bond girl in Goldfinger. It's pussy galore, you know, and of course, the, the unification of the sun and moon what the Rosicrucians would call your alchemical wedding. This is the, you know, the, the Gnostic, you know, marriage as it were. Um, and this of course leads to the completion of the finality of the process red. Well, if you watch Goldfinger, you will never see the color red in that movie. The red is absent because the alchemical process fails. If you wish to see movies where the alchemical completion is success successful, Take a look at the movie Black Swan with Natalie Portman. There's a couple others out there from Hell's Another One with Johnny Depp, where um, you have her using um, this this um, bizarre form of you know sexual chaos magic to transmute herself into this um, this demonic black swan creature, um, and in the movie um, when the finality is, you know, when she finally is able to perfect this alchemical transition um, it's in the nightclub this is where she can't tell reality from fantasy anymore and it's the flashing red symbolizing that the alchemical process is now complete you will see this suggested in the movie from hell with johnny depp and heather graham that's alchemical um, where um, you have the jack the ripper character using the masonic rituals as chaos magic to negatively transmute the 20th century um, I'm trying to think of some other movies that are alchemical in themes. Um, uh, Black Swan's one. Goldfinger is probably the godfather of them all. Now you mentioned uh, a project that you were involved with, and uh, it, it's well known, The Ninth Gate, the movie with Johnny Depp. Uh, right. That, that, is, that is an actual book that people don't understand, that there, there are nine uh, plate engravings in this book. And right. But in, in the book, it's more Kabbalistic. It's 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 he's it's it's more Kabbalah. They changed it. They changed it in the movie to Devil mm. Worship. I, I suspect they did that for a theatrical. You know, I think I think Satanism probably is more enticing than Kabbalah is. Um, but yeah, oh good God, yeah. Um, the, yeah, I mean the, it, it's it's a yeah. great book. I, I actually have yeah. the uh, this. I don't have I have the originals. I have scans of the original, and I think right. they're fantastic pieces of work. Uh, I think it's an ex excellent book, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that they had changed it for the movie. Uh, and a lot of times that's done, and not always for the wrong cause. Uh, it, it is a business they're in, and uh, yeah, the um, things the, the ninth sell, gate certainly. is a book. Is, is yeah, the the ninth gate is a movie I, I analyze in the Royal Arch of Enoch. If you're interested in this material that we're talking about right now, I talk about this in the in the, at the last chapter of the Royal Arch, um, and the ninth gate is a movie I analyze where. Um, you have the plates in the book. Um, these are modeled. Um, you'll see a lot of obvious, you know, tarot card imagery in these plates. Um, you will see um, a lot of imagery that looks like the Lutheran Bible in these plates. You have um, 
um, in, in in this you have the um, uh, the the Torquia character. This is the guy who wrote the the Grimoire, the Ninth Gates, and was burned at the stake um, for dabbling with this material. This is a clear reflection of Giordana Bruno, who was burned at the stake, who was into this you know you know Hermetic tradition as well. Obviously, Torquia is a much darker version of it. Um, the Balkan character who is performing the Goetia magic, who is trying to you know you know summon the the, the demon or the devil with Lucifer, which is kind of incorrect but um you know this is clearly like an alistair crowley he's doing this you know goetia magic um the 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 guy the, this is a good one the guys who are the keepers of the wisdom in this are the seneza brothers the twin brothers i was going to ask the, about these guys yes please. yeah this is the hermes trismegistus characters gemini the twins um is ruled by the planet mercury which of course is hermes um and these are your 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 uh you know hermes trismegistus characters and of course this is why they work in the bookshop is they're the keepers of the wisdom um pay attention to this if if you watch this the next time um and a lot of people aren't aware of this when johnny when the johnny depp character um um, a character goes to visit them in the bookshop in Spain at the beginning, you know, they kind of help him. Um, and you know, you know, they, they put him on the right path or whatever. And they talk about the book being written or the, some of the engravings being done by Lucifer. I think it was, well, at, at the end of the movie, I guess I'm spoiling it here, but it's been out for so long. So why not? <laughs> The, the, when, 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 when the one plate in the book is bogus, it's a forgery, the, the Lucifer, which is the girl, tells him that the Sienna brothers have it. Well, when he goes back there, a lot of people aren't aware that the two workers in the, in the, in the bookstore who are clearing it out, that's them. That, that's, that's the Sienna brothers. That's the same actor playing those two guys. They're just like, you know, it's, it's the same actor, and now they're foreign to him all of a sudden. Right. Um, and, of course, they move the bookshelf, and now down comes the real, you know, providing the wisdom. Down comes the real plate. And then, of course, the Dean Corso character, which is Depp, now has all the correct plates. The satanic riddle is solved, and he walks into the castle and receives the esoteric light, the, the gnosis. Um, inside the uh, castle there at the end. And then, of course, you also have, um, you know, you know in, 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 in this is something I'm talking about in cinema symbolism. I, I revisit the Ninth Gate briefly. Um, you have the trickster goddess Lilith um, in, in, in this. This is the uh, Gnostic trickster goddess. Um, uh, this is the Liana character, you know, Liana, Lilith, very similar. And in Black Swan, of course, with Natalie Portman, um, the trickster goddess who lures her into the dark side is, of course, Lily, who is Lilith. This is the Mila Kunis character. Um, you'll see her turn up, turn up in uh, Black Swan as well. Um, so you'll see goddesses and goddesses, uh, gods and goddesses turn up in uh, films anthropomorphized as well. Very cool. Very cool. Tim, uh, we're, we're heading towards the end of the program, Mr. Sullivan, yeah. and I want to give you uh, I want to give more time so we could get your links out there, especially for the pre-orders and and uh, for everything else. Uh, Tim, do you you had a question you wanted to yeah, get to before um, we wrap it up? Mike R. in the chat room had mentioned uh, Lord of the Rings and the all seeing eye. Um, it always occurred to me that the um, that that series in particular had uh, significant alchemical references and um i just want to know your take on that other than the all-seeing eye right right well what you have going on with the lord of the rings um is is i wouldn't necessarily say it's alchemical um but what you have going on there is um it's the same thing it's, it's this is what's called the monomyth and it's described by a mythologist named joseph campbell where you have the solar savior archetype who who is put on a path to save the world um, and, you know, he meets and encounters certain characters that are universal. Um, and, and you'll see this, you'll see this in, in Lord of the Rings, the, you know, forget the Hobbit stuff for right now, but in Lord of the Rings, the savior of Middle Earth, Middle Earth is, you know, the Frodo Baggins character, you know, and this guy is always assisted by this Hermes Trismegistus character. This is the old gray beard who, you know, has the wisdom, knows everything, but only doles it out piecemeal in, 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 in Lord of the Rings. This is Gandalf the gray, excuse me, in the matrix trilogy. This is Morpheus, who, who, who knows, you know, the, the reality, knows the Neo's the one, knows the difference between the real world and fake world, is able to, manip, you know, is able to manipulate them. In Star Wars, this is, of course, Obi-Wan Kenobi, who knows the truth about Luke and Leia and who Darth Vader is. Um, when Kenobi's killed, his mantle's picked up by Yoda in, in Empire. 
Um, Merlin the Magician in the Arthurian legend is, is the Hermes Trismegistus character. Pay attention when you watch Excalibur next time. When you see Merlin first appear on screen, he is coming up over the horizon, symbolizing the rising sun that brings light, wisdom, enlightenment. Take a look at the tip of his, if you think I'm stretching this still, take a look at the tip of his, of his staff. It has the two serpents on it, symbolizing the caduceus of Hermes. So, you know, you will, you will, see, you will see Hermes Trismegistus and Merlin. But what you have with Lord of the Rings uh, is this is the Campbell monomyth. Um, and, you know, we don't have time to get into the, all of it for right now, but there are these elements, and you'll see these elements play out in Star Wars, The Matrix, um, and, and Lord of the Rings. And, of course, you have in this with, with Tolkien, um, he was a member of a group in Oxford. He was at Christchurch. Um, he hung out at this bar in Oxford called The Eagle and Child with C.S. Lewis, who did the Narnia Chronicles. Right. One of the guys, one of the guys who was influential on both of them, is this character. He was more more influential on Lewis than he was Tolkien. Was a guy named Charles Williams. I don't know if that name rings any bells for you guys. He was in the he was in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn with Bram Stoker and McGregor Mathers. He rubs off more on 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 Lewis than he does on Tolkien. Um, but you know, you know, I mean, you know, Tolkien. You got to remember. You know, when he's writing these things, you know, Tolkien was in the in World War One. You know, you know, you know, saw the horrors of World War One. You you will see these some political figures um, turn up in 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 uh, Lord of the Rings. For example, Sorum in the White is Karl Marx, who wants to unite all the orcs or the proletariat under the white banner. You know, this is orcs in all lands unite. Um, you know, to combat. You know, he wants to industrialize Middle Earth. You know, and destroy nature. You know, and, and he wants to do battle with the aristocracy of Middle Earth, which are the elves. You know, and and the and, and the humans, and even the dwarfs and the hobbits to some extent. Then you have the Golem Schmeagel character, which is uh, he is alchemical. Um, you know, he he is what is called an alchemical Golem. This is a creature that was something else, but through possession of something, has transmuted, transmuted him into something right. that. That, that he is no longer and he has no knowledge of his former self. So Schmeagel, through possession of this magical ring, alchemically transforms into Golem um, and has no memory of the Schmeagel character. The only other, the only another one of these alchemical Golems is the character of Johnny Favorite in Angel Heart, who was once or is Harry Angel, who through satanic rites becomes uh, he was Johnny Favorite becomes Harry Angel with no memory of the others. These are what are called alchemical Golems. Um, I talk more about this in um, in Cinema Symbolism too. Uh, the Black Swan Nina, Nina Seya characters is also uh, an alchemical golem. She she uses the sex magic to transform herself into this black swan with no memory of her goody two shoes former self. But yeah, with with Lord of the Rings, you have a lot going on there. Um, I do a whole in depth analysis of the three movies. I didn't do any of the Hobbit movies because they weren't out when I was writing this. I'm doing. I'm going to revisit the Hobbit in CS two or Cinema Symbolism too. But yeah, um, Lord of the Rings has a lot going on in it. Um, you know, and 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 you know, if you're into that material, I've got a whole chapter on Lord of the Rings in Cinema Symbolism. Yeah, definitely. Well, I uh, I actually did read all three of his of the books, and uh, it took a long time to read that. Because <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If they're, yeah, they're, they're ever read it. They're classics. They're classics. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So, Robert, we're heading to the end of the show here. Uh, okay. Everyone, we thank you so much. We had Mr. Robert W. Sullivan fourth, and uh, I'll tell you, it was absolute pleasure. You're a gentleman, a scholar, and well educated, no doubt. Uh, we're we we are directing people to your personal website or your your management website. Is that correct for rsplaunchpad.com? That that's my publisher's website. Um, okay. If you want to go to my, if you want to send, if you my website is Robert W Sullivan IV dot com. The book, the the cinema symbolism book, these will be signed copies. This will be available for pre order in the next forty eight to seventy two hours, and these signed copies will only be sold to my publisher, which is RSP Launchpad. You, if you direct people to my webpage, which is okay. Robert W Sullivan IV dot com, I will have links there as soon as it goes live. I will plaster it all over my social media. If you if you go to my website, um, there are links there to buy the Royal Arch book. It's in the Kindle. You can get the oversized paperback. There are links to all my social media, YouTube channel, other podcasts I've done. I've got a Twitter feed, Facebook like pages, the whole thing. Um, and 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 the Royal Arch book, 
This will happen more probably towards the end of the week, but there will be signed copies available again through my publisher, and I'll promote this as well on the on the social media. Um, and the, these will be signed copies of Royal Arch of Enoch, the paperback, through my publisher's website only, and I'll be providing a link for that. But the Cinema Symbolism book will be available for pre-order. I stress that's pre-order, um, and that will be coming in the next 48 hours. Um, and that will be on my website and all my social media. I'll put a link up, and this will be a signed copy of the book. You can pre-order it, and that copy will ship mid to late June of this year. And everyone, also, uh, you check out, as he said, his, his social media, like his Facebook page. He has a Facebook page for each one of the, the books and himself, and uh, a lot of good stuff on there as well. So you could find him out there, and I highly recommend picking up one of these books. Excellent recommendations for Father's Day that's coming up. Uh, these these are books of great interest, and anyone with a, an interesting mind that's looking for uh, hidden things that were uh, laid in plain sight, uh, this is the guy who's letting you know where it's at. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, again, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us, and I hope we can have you come back sometime. Uh, I feel we could have gone two more hours. If, yeah, uh, I, I think so, too. Um, listen, I want to say, Joe, thank you for having me on Researchers Radio. Listen, I, I really appreciate it. I thought it was a great show. Um, I really enjoyed being on here, and um, I will definitely come back on. Maybe we, maybe a month or two we could do a whole show on cinema symbolism. Certainly, I, I will have, have no problem visiting the Royal Arch of Enoch again. Um, we could get into some of the sacred architecture, some of the more of the sacred symbols. Um you know, do something on that. But I, I really want to say I really appreciate you having me on, and I thought it was a great show, and I look forward to returning. Thank you. It's it's really Thank our you. pleasure. Uh, I would like to return to your, your works again, uh, especially once uh, the uh, Cinema Symbols has, has been out. I don't want to get into it too much and, and take away from uh, the expectations. Uh, but hopefully we can revisit again. And once again, really, thank you so much. Uh, you're a gentleman and a scholar, and uh, it, it was an excellent program, and I can't wait to have you back. Well, I really appreciate you having me on, Joe, and um, it was a great program. And like I said, um, you know, you know, was, uh, I thought it was a great show. And we definitely do some more in cinema symbolism, and we'll definitely revisit, you know, esoteric Freemasonry. We can do that some more too. You got it, and we'll uh, awesome. we'll post we'll Thanks, post Robert. the links for everyone to uh, get to your books, and uh, and uh, I'll be in touch with you real soon. Thanks again. Uh, all right. Thanks, Joe. Have a great day. Thanks, Robert. That was excellent. I really enjoyed the program tonight, guys. Uh, very intelligent man, very thorough, and uh, I, I like a guy who uh, has his ducks in a row uh, when he's uh, working on a project like that. Interesting. Uh, he he wasn't afraid to uh, to really delve into the uh, well, some of the the harder to, to ask questions about with the with Freemasonry. I mean, a lot of, when you do ask for you know authors or whatever, anyone who who's involved with Freemasonry, that a lot of times they're pretty hesitant. Well, you know, he's got nothing to hide, as as the true Freemasons say. I mean, it's it's they don't have any secret books that no one else is allowed to read. You could read the same things if if you can't understand what they see. It's, I mean, that's a, a difference of beliefs, I would suppose, and, and that's fine. This is America, and uh, and I'm just grateful he has the courage to speak up about it uh, uh, when there's usually a lot of people uh, ready to shoot them down. So uh, I think he's produced fantastic works, and uh, and I hope he continues to do so. He he knows what he's talking about. He's he's uh, not giving uh, so much a opinion. He's putting facts where it's got to be. But uh, guys, uh, we're wrapping it up here. Uh, I, I missed over at the break. I want to remind everyone we are the uh, largest listener-supported radio station, and uh, we we solely run here on donations. The station. If you could please make your way to freedomslips.com. Uh, on the home page, you'll find a, a donation button. Please make a donation, uh, $5, $10, $20. Uh, I, I, I even encourage if anyone enjoying the program out there and you want to throw a dollar in the hat, it goes a long way. And uh, if you enjoy another program, throw another dollar in at that time. Uh, it, it really goes a long way, especially in a time when uh, right now, the FCC is trying to put regulations on media such as this station here. Uh, I also wanted to let everyone know uh, the station is still working hand-in-hand uh, hand on a daily basis uh, with uh, the people out in Nevada, the Bundy Ranch, and the station continuously, uh, Nighthawk included, uh, here at the station. He leads the way, and 
He's been uh, setting up great contacts and getting uh, excellent information and interviews, and it's going both ways. And he asked for uh, some funds to come in from uh, all of our listeners, and uh, a lot of the hosts work with their listeners. And uh, between everyone, uh, Nighthawk here at the station was able to get a lot of supplies necessary in regards to generators, uh, batteries, power inverters uh, for using the batteries with solar, gas cards, uh, food. Uh, provisions uh, here at Researchers Radio Live. We sent out a thousand watt inverter and a few other things. Also, it was a, a goodie package to get out there. I want to thank all our listeners for that and everyone else at the station. And uh, we have some good shows coming up. Uh, Dave, we have a good show coming up with Mr. Chad Meek, don't we? Yeah, we do. Yeah, uh, that's a, that's looking to be a good one. What is the, the name of this one is Big Rock, right? The Big Rock. It was the UFO phenomenon in New Mexico. <clears throat> yeah, basically it was a, the Van Tassel tale of UFOs. And uh, it's kind of like the old, it's the old Space Brothers stuff, but it's a very intriguing tale. Oh, I, I'm looking Where forward to it because I, I'm, I really don't even know too much on the topic. And Big Rock was where all the first UFO you know, conferences and conventions started. So, Well, and next week we got uh, Fritz Zimmerman. So we're going to be speaking about uh, um, ancient American mounds and such next week. So everyone tune in next week. Uh, thanks again from Tim C., Dave Stanett, and myself, Joe Kiernan. Uh, thank you from Researchers Radio Live. We'll see you next Sunday. And please stay tuned here in Studio B for Alchemical Connections. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Have a good, good night. night. Revolution Radio. Enter into a world unseen on Raven Star's Witching Hour. You will encounter eclectic topics from the realm of spirit brought into our matrix of truth. With your host, the Solaris Blue Raven. Solaris will bring you an array of unique guests covering topics from ghostly spirits to amazing anomalies, covert technology, UFOs, and shadowy global events. And that's right here at Revolution Radio Freedom Slips.com, Saturdays, midnight till 2 a.m. Eastern Time. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Let the magic rise. <laughs> Hi, this is Bo. And this is Rocco. And the Bo and Rocco Show is here to offer insight into legal and lawful remedies. Our goal is to remain free and help others remain free in an ever-increasing police-like state. With the help of our guests, we try to answer questions such as what went wrong and what can we do about it. So tune in to Revolution Radio at www.freedomslips.com Wednesday nights, 10 to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to listen to the Bo and Rocco Show. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Revolution Radio. Every Tuesday evening on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com, we present our goddess spiritual warrior, Kathy Bilski. I command, I call to the architect of the universe's divine creators and ask for permission to quantum leave the world in all life forms on all planes and dimensions. You need some more speed records in this day and age. You need coverage. Coverage? Oh, you mean them little root weevils that crawl around popping off cameras in your face? Those root weevils write history.
Many of you know that quote by Jack Nicholson and a few good men. You can't handle the truth. Well, you can, and Event Horizons will give you those truths when you're mad as hell and not going to take it anymore from that memorable senior network. You'll know just what to do. We will draw you in and become your news addiction at Event Horizons. Join us Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to noon Eastern Time at freedomslips.com at Revolution Radio. Our world team members are Dennis Fetcho, John Ilias, David Dunger, Hila Cass, MD, Melanie Richton, Jim Mars, Paula Harris, John Trallo, Maria Payan, Christopher Husser, D-O-D-D-S, Jonathan Orchard, and me, your anchor, Dr. Robin Falco. If uh, you decide not to volunteer, it will not be held against you in any way. Sounds dangerous. It is. Very dangerous. Count me in. And that's right here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps. Enjoy your extra big ass fries. You didn't give me no fries, I got an empty box. Would you like another extra big ass fries? I said I didn't get any. Thank you. Your account has been charged. Your balance is zero. Please what? come back when you can afford oh, to make no, a purchase. No. I'm sorry you're having trouble. Come on. Trouble. I'm, I'm sorry you're having starving. trouble. Thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio. Here at Revolution Radio, we believe in freedom of ideas, freedom of speech, but above all, we believe in freedom of existence through self-reliance. This station is 100% listener-supported, and as a fundraising promotion, I have a kick-ass free gift for a $100 donation. 35,000 seeds. 25 years in the freezer. Long-term storable, 54 different varieties. So if food prices go crazy... The shit hits the fan, or if you just want to save tons of money every year by creating your own food like I do, grab our seed pack special. Just look for the banner on the homepage at freedomslips.com. Don't be a statistic. Don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. We need as humans to start taking care of ourselves and not depending on the mega courts to provide unhealthy, nasty food. Included in this package is also a DVD with 900 survival and off-grid living documents and the offline home canning how to do everything website all on the DVD. So when you're growing all that food, you know how to can it, store it, preserve it, etc. with all these documents. So thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I hope that you will pick up this package and start learning to be free. Revolution Radio Freedom Slips.com, where information never sleeps and freedom is one seed that needs to be planted. What we do in life, it goes in eternity. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Joe Kiernan, host of Researchers Radio Live, co-hosted by my man Dave Stanett and Tim C. is here producing as well. How are you tonight, gentlemen? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good day. Good day. I know we have some some Aussie friends listening to the program, and uh, it's it's always so strange. I want to say good morning to them, but it's <laughs> it's approaching afternoon, really. It's so strange. It's uh reminds me the world the world's really not so big sometimes, you know, when you think how could it go around so fast. But so how's the weather up there, Dave? Yeah, it's starting to turn. I was up in the mountains this weekend working on the house and the mountains are green and right on. The rivers are roaring. <laughs> we had some uh some bad storms come here th- the other night, possible tornadoes and uh it was just some some bad wind, but it threw. It was like ninety degrees every single day, and it dropped it down to the seventies. So it's been pretty moderate the last few days. It's yeah, nice we for, haven't nice got any break. It's been yeah. kind of sitting in the mid sixties here. All right, all right, Tim, how are you? Doing well. Doing well. Doing well. Um, you sound distant. I'm pretty similar up, similar up here. You sound very far away. Do I? You do. Can you hear me now? Um, oh, I hear you. <laughs> Fantastic, buddy. <laughs> Sounds yeah, great. we uh we were supposed to get floods in this area up here in uh, upstate New York, but 
you know, I only it didn't really pan out. Thankfully, I'm not going to say I'm complaining about that. Right on. Yeah, they're, they're calling for frost patches what? up in the mountains. Am I really? Wow, <laughs> man. Wow. So uh, last week we had a good show. Linda Zimmerman had great yeah. feedback. And uh, I want to thank her again for coming on. And uh, we have some good programs coming up. But today's program, we have uh, Mr. Robert W. Sullivan IV, a 32nd degree Freemason, author of The Royal Arch of Enoch, and also the author of an upcoming book that will be released next week. And that book is known as Cinema's Symbolism. And uh, obviously, just as the title is, it's a lot of symbolism hidden and placed in, in movies and TV and basically scattered around and uh, without people's notice for so long. And uh, it's usually under design. And uh, we're, we're going to get to pry into and in how people go ahead and uh, planning these things. It's been done in arts for a number of years and motion pictures is one of them. And uh, we know there's been a lot of symbolism placed through them and uh, it would be nice to see if there is a particular arrangement of all of them, a little bit of symbolism in, in everything, as uh, yeah, as I'm sure nice. it is. And uh, I, I, I'm excited about having him on. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I am a big fan of any 30-second degree that wants to come on and chit-chat. Definitely. You know, it's, it's funny because it, that's probably one of the nagging questions I have is, we, you know what's going on, and you know the scale on which it's going on. So who's co coordinating the goings on? So I, I understand it's uh, it's key people, but you know, as I think it's been very clear, uh, people uh, understand my take on it is it's it's really not so much what people think, but uh, I can't control what people think or believe. Uh, people, you know, I'm sure there there are Freemasons that are up to no good. However, they're they're not all bad, uh, and in the same respect, there's a lot of Masons that are uh, members to lodges that uh, you, it might as well just be a social club per se. That uh, its it, true purpose isn't uh, learning of of teachings uh, and ways. You know, I I would suspect that uh, even if there isn't a let's just say diabolical scheme plan. Uh, let's just say that um, at one time there probably wasn't, and more or less, I, I would say it's probably just been exploited. You know, if there, hey, that's just my take. Right. Um, right. But, well, I mean, it's. It, I was gonna say I come from a family of Scots, and some of them are, are Masons, <laughs> but you know, it doesn't seem to be. It doesn't make them bad. It doesn't make them bad right, either day. Right. Yeah, I have friends that are Freemasons. And you know, I, I like the, the Latin expression. I, I use it a lot because English is such a terrible language for expression. But there's this expression. <laughs> it's post hoc ergo propter hoc. And what it means is uh, basically it's, it's, it's easier to explain it by a similarity. It's, it means essentially if it's every time it rains, uh, my knee hurts. But – just because my knee hurts today doesn't mean it's raining in, in the same sense where uh, just because there might be people that are wrongdoers in opinions or in fact, uh, just because they might be a, a Freemason or of any level or any association doesn't mean the rest of them are. Or, or does it? You know, this, this might be something we could ask Mr.